So now we have uh, Gio Sehon from the uh, University of Manitoba. He gets his PhD from the uh, University of Toulouse, and then he goes to the CA subject to work for his first postdoc. He was in my brother's name, I never met him there. And uh, his main research includes simulating particle acceleration by uh, short wave in the galaxies, mostly in supernova randoms and supernovas. And he's also interested in modeling the associated emission from the uh, short wave. So today he's going to talk about this work. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to talk about particle acceleration in supernova remnants, and first I will give you an introduction on this topic and so why we think that the supernova remnants may be uh, accelerators of particles. And as the interplay between the particles and the shocks are complex, I will show you how we are using mostly numerical simulations to we're using numerical simulation to address this issue, and so I'll show you how we couple the proof. It's, it's, uh, it's just recording, it's not amplified. Okay. So I will show you some simulations and show you uh, the thermal and non-thermal emission from the remnants that we can attend and what it means in terms of diagnostics of the efficiency of particle acceleration. And finally, I will present a catalog of observations of uh, supernova remnants in the galaxy at high energies. So first, let me refer to some facts about cosmic rays. So cosmic rays actually are particles. This is the composition of cosmic rays. Uh, so in black compared to a solar system other than seen in blue. So this is quite normal matter. Uh, and so this is consistent with the idea that these particles are nothing but ISM that was swept up by a supernova shock with some particularities pointing towards some particular environments. But the, the most impressive uh, observation, of course, is uh, the energy spectrum of the cosmic radiation, this spectrum which extends over several orders of magnitude in energy as a quasi-perfect forward law. And so, you're reaching energies that are almost macroscopic energy in a single particle. So which accelerators can possibly do that? Well, in the galaxy, supernova remnants were identified uh, based on energetic considerations first. And then we found a mechanism, a Fermi uh, mechanism, that can explain how particles, charged particles, <coughs> are accelerated by a shockwave magnetite shockwave, and it does produce power of spectra as observed. Now, this works well in the test particle regime, where uh, particles are not important for the dynamics, but in fact it's known that if they are efficiently accelerated, in fact it will modify uh, the spectrum, and so it's not just the picture, it's not that simple. But so do we see accelerated particles in this environment? Well, electrons certainly, we see them shine in synchrotron radiation and we've seen them for a, lot, a long time in radio and we see them now in X-rays as well. So this is Cassio beta. Okay. And for protons it's not that clear because electrons are <coughs> a fraction of the cosmic radiation. Really we are working for protons or ions. And it's been just a few years since we've been able to map uh, supernova remnants at very high energies with uh, Cherenkov telescopes. This is very fast. But it's difficult to disentangle emissions from protons and from electrons. So very recently, there was uh, a paper in science where the Fermi team has been able to observe 
the characteristic signature of protons in two photon environments, but these are middle-aged ones which are no longer supposed to be very efficient accelerators. But it's still unclear if we can actually but which energy we can reach in the photonics. We know that the end of the spectrum probably has an extra galactic origin. But we would like galactic sources to reach at least the first break in the spectrum, which is probably around 10 to 50 d even that is quite tough. So this is another broad -band view on supernova radio emission. When for uh, the moment of the supernova observed in 10 of 6, so particles are at both ends of the spectrum. We see electrons uh, in the synchrotron emission from the radio to the X-ray, and you see inverse Compton emission in gamma rays. And protons, when they collide with ambient matter, produce pions which contain gamma rays. So in between, yes. Which is which? So you go really It's difficult. So there is, there is a spectral feature of the pion emitter, which is a bump due to the threshold for pion pollution, which they believe they have observed uh, the okay. pyramids. But it's difficult to tell because it's just an entry into the spectrum and it can be other effects. But my point is that. So in between you see um, yeah, the plasma, the thermal plasma, which shines mostly in its X-rays because it's very hot. And my point is, if acceleration is as efficient as we believe, then it should impact the evolution of the remnant itself. So you should also signature of here. Sometimes in the you can still put banner lines, which creates uh, a short form. Useful but not of the and so this is a snapshot, so after 1,000 years, the structure is evolving in the time of course. And so this is a sketch of the remnants. So first let me recall you that there are actually two shots. The forward shock, uh, as the DJK in, in green, are ejected supersonically, so they drive a short wave, the power shock, which is ahead of them traveling in the interstellar medium. This is a shock ISM, this is a shock ISM. And as they are forced to decelerate, there is a river shock that is going backwards. It is so this is shock ejecta and this is unshock ejecta. And this, this, continue, this interface for the contact is continuing between ejecta and green and ISM and so it's unstable, it's ready. And it's subject to the relative law instability, and so this is probably what makes this turbulent uh, that you see. This is a, an image of another remnant in by the time. Do you know what, are the, what the physical scale is, physical size? So I give you some sizes here. Okay. So this one. I don't feel like that. So this one is typically a few parsecs of radius of this edge. What's the propagation? For, for typical uh, ambient conditions, so this is for an average ISM that we depend, of course, on the density and on the temperature. So for a typical uh, temperature of 10 to the 4 Kelvin, initially you have velocities of tens of thousands of kilometers per second. And this is maybe like 5,000 kilometers per second after 500 years. Okay. So it's supersonic, is it? Maybe Mach numbers of hundreds. And first it takes on almost freely in the ISM, and eventually it will enter the so called state of phase, which is on that's similar algebraic phase. And it's only after tens of thousands of years that the radiation is strong enough that it impacts the dynamics. So we are not interested in early phases here. 
when the shock speed is high and when you really acceleration or test. So these are called non-radiating phases because radiation is not dynamically important, but there is an emission of course. And okay, so this is the hot shock medium in green. And also notice this thin blue ring around the remnant. This is the location of the forward shock. This one which is stressed by electrons which are accelerating at the blast rate. So this is some evolution, this is not so And when you try to model this object, you see that it does not match uh, purely hydro models, and there is some energy that is missing. And we believe it's going in cosmic ray. So this is what we are trying to simulate with numerical with numerical models. So these are the actors of the problem. Shock wave, the thermal plasma, the population of energetic particles, which are the super thermal population, which really is great. So these particles are actually particles from the plasma, which are injected at the shock front and accelerated by the, by the shock discontinuity. And if the pressure uh, gets high enough, we can in turn modify the structure of the shock itself, and thus the way they are accelerated. We have a nonlinear loop here. And this is possible because of the coupling made to the magnetic waves. And I'll say more about that later. So let me focus on this, this stage. So to couple the iron in the genetic description, I'm using a, a 3D hydro code, which is an access. If you may know it's been used, developed and used mostly for cosmology. It was adapted to a certain environment using a co-moving grid so that we factor on the expansion of the remnant and we will factor on the above expansion. And this is coupled to a model of acceleration. This is a semi-analytical model. It will be too expensive to actually uh, solve the, the full equations. But it's a nonlinear model, so it takes into account the back reaction of particles. And it's a, it's a goal to credit you know, the shock conditions, or the shock should be modified. And we force this modification back to the hydro. So we start at the small edge, in the Chevalier profile, for a typical SN1 remnant like Tycho. And we evolve it with the code, and this is what to get at the end after five hundred years, the edge of Tycho. <coughs> and so this is a slice so that you can see inside of those books. So again, the ejector and the ISM. So the reverse shock, and stable contact discontinuity and forward shock. And this is the normal case, and this is the case with the back reaction of particles. The particles accelerated as a forward shock take some energy, and so the the medium is more compressible and so the shock region shrinks. It's narrower, it's denser. So the, the, the fact that it's narrower, it's, well, it's a small effect, but it can be measured and this can explain what is observed in the type of Now this is just uh, the density that you are seeing. Let me show you the actual emission from the remnant. It depends on the density square, on the temperature, the electronic temperature, we have the, the ion temperature. So we have seen some equilibration from the civilization of the shock. And we can work out the ionization state of the plasma out of equilibrium, because it's, the subjects are too young for that. And then we can compute the emission, the thermal emission, which is uh, the continuum and the lines for different elements. This is an integrated spectrum for all elements. So this is the sum of these are three, three elements, iron, silicon, oxygen. We have 15 of them. And this is integrated spatially, but you have that in each cell, and so you can produce 
collecting the maps of the emission as we look at the in different bands and looking at the remnants in different bands, corresponding to different elements that form different plasma conditions to allow you to see different levels of the effect of back reaction. So if I'm putting this together, this is a composite image, I don't know if it's clear, but so, so this is a slice again, this is a projection. So red, green, blue are three narrow bands in energy. And this is the unmodified shock on the left, and this is with acceleration and backreaction of particles on the right, so I don't know if you see well, but things, things are a bit redistributed, like the particle of this, this blue emission here, yeah, which require high uh, temperatures. It's switched off here yeah, because energy energy is coming to cosmic interest. So these are scientific maps that you can compare to observations that you can have seen before. So, the, so this is a thermal emission and then actually you put it in a non-thermal emission and this is where the magnetic field will be important. So cosmic rays can be accelerated because they are scattered by magnetic fluctuations in the vicinity of the shock. But so why should there be such fluctuations? Well, interestingly, the particles at the primary end of the shock, they can trigger, they will trigger some instability that will generate some magnetic turbulence that they need to be confined and to be accelerated. So there is another that reaction loop here. There are various instabilities. This is just a recipe for magnetic pressure from one of them. But you can plug in the model. And so these waves and they can be either damped in the plasma and preheated, or they can be carried to the shock. And so it's magnetized with shock with different jump conditions. And the end result is that uh, the intensity of the back reaction is less. And so these are two, two opposite cases. Interestingly, the, in terms of morphology, the effect is the same, whether you have or not uh, defined the magnetic field. But the value of the field downstream will be much different. This is a standard case where considering a, a, an ambient field of five maybe a little more, you get downstream magnetic fields of a few tenths of microtons maybe. With magnetic field amplification, we can reach hundreds of microtons. And this will impact, of course, electrons. This is the maximum energy. Electrons are confined close to the shock only because of losses, radiative losses, including. Uh, and this is their emission in cyclotron x-rays and so we will see a ring close to the shock and you see with magnetic field amplification at the bottom you see how this ring can get very very narrow as of so this is the same as what you've seen in the image of Tycho and so the conclusion is that even if it's difficult to see protons radiate they will impact dynamics of the remnant and so that will impact the thermal radiation of the remnant itself and they will impact the evolution of the magnetic field and that will impact the radiation of the electrons and I okay. this is because I would like briefly to show you a catalog of high energy observations that I need to try to sort things out and there exists a catalog of remnants by Dave Green, but it's mostly based on radio. So we are interested in high energies with the one particle acceleration. There are some observatories with nice uh, resources, but yeah, the point is to group them together for the first time. We have also some resources for a specific energy domain, TLCAT. T but they will list everything. Remnants might not be there or might be there multiple times. So here we are really interested in 
specific physical object. And we wanted to be discussed today. So Prince uh, was last updated years ago, and things are moving very fast in the field. We do observations typically every week. And we wanted something easy to manipulate, so we have uh, a database, and there is public access for a uh, dedicated front end, which is online. So this is the main page, this is a list of front ends. We have 309 objects in the galaxy. And the first columns are properties like the ID, which is the coordinates, and other names. Cast A. The context will be like if you have a neutron star or a pulsar that was found, or the magnetar candidates, for instance. We have some edge and distance estimates, so these are really the estimates, not for all of them. And we like to double check. And we have also 14 reports of uh, the sighting of the supernova. And it happens that 14 remnants are referring to them, but it's not one for one. We have some well-identified historical remnants and order for which one may be the candidate. It's important, of course, because it's, if it's certain, it's presumed that they fake. And then we have uh, some important instruments and in whether it was observed or not. So when the name is written, we have some information, but white and black means it was actually missed. And this means that it was detected, and in blue means that we have an extended source. And if you click on it, you can sort, you can reorder the columns, so you can tell me, you can tell me if you want extended sources, you can buy the journey, you can For this remnant, the more detailed properties and the list of all observations. So I will sign the almost 1,000 reports of high energy observations. And we are trying to say, so we are giving it for each of them the references and the things to give yes, and we are trying to say what we believe is observed. Sometimes it might not be related to the one end, but it's still important to know. And so like green half of the case is it will be related to the central object that will survive the wind. And now of the case it will be related to the shell, to the ejecta, which uh, I am interested in. So you are both in this object, which is a composite. And so this is something, of course, this is to be updated uh, continuously. So if you spot something missing or want to let us know, there is a feedback form to the website. And eventually, we'll try to extend it, maybe to try an active remnant, so not too far away, but in the SMT and the LMT, we have nice data. And the so green is the radio. We consolidated the uh, X-rays and gamma rays, and it would be interesting to read in between as well. And even there, you can have interesting diagnostics for acceleration. So again, in science, uh, we can think we have a nice paper on SM1006 when they see the Palmer filament with a very high resolution, and that gives proofs about the presence of energy problems. So this is it. Thank you.
reproduce a uh, typo very well, but do you, do you actually learn much about the cosmic rays themselves? I guess you learn how much energy you put in cosmic rays from, from that. And do you actually, but do you get any information about how high, how low you can accelerate them, or are you actually playing around with? Yes, that's a good question. So it gives you uh, indications from the efficiency in terms of the fraction of the energy that goes into particles. But it's it's difficult to tell exactly which maximum energy you will get with this model. For the acceleration model is not completed itself in yeah. the maximum energy with some recipient from that. There's an edge so the hydro model doesn't really care if this got up to this uh, subgrid model doesn't really care about how high you're sorry. The hydro model itself, no. Want to uh, investigate the maximum energy for you have to direct simulation. Trying to do a bit of a break down. This is a question from someone working on galaxy formation. I noticed that you mentioned that there will be observations on the LMC and SMC. Just wondering what's the motivation there? You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, it's just that we, we have some good data on this satellite galaxies. For other galaxies, it's just not far away to see the environment. So you just see how it will be. It's about to make it come out there. And I think it's true that we have some very detailed observations on this galaxy or SMC. Well, it's too bad they are not included in the single category. So, so you showed this, this very nice picture of Tycho uh, from the simulation. What are the quantitative measures that one really would like to, to check to see whether a simulation matches the observations? Is it the width of the shell, or, or is that some of the sub-resolution? Yeah. What is the first thing we do get? Position of the forward shock, so you can see. But is there a degeneracy there with age and energy, or yeah. are these now? Of course, other? it depends on those factors, but mm -hmm. when you do the modeling, it's really tough to put some uh, all things together. People try, and want to show you a lot of plots, but, so. but, but isn't it? You mean that it doesn't work? But, but isn't it the case that the, the where you think the contact discontinuity is relative to the forward shock is narrower <coughs> than you would with if you didn't include the particle acceleration, or can you get that some other way? So, so, again, so where you see the forward shock and where the forward shock is the, in the in the discon contact discontinuity isn't that I always thought I thought that was supposed to be narrower than you would get with a, a model without particle acceleration. Yeah. So that's so that is the measure. You know. Yeah. yeah. Which is not degenerate with age necessarily. Well, it depends on the things like the explosion of all files or like that. But it's very wrong, but it's. Yeah. And then I'm saying it's so narrow that it should, all the energy in the grade is so too narrow. What do you mean? Seeing that gap there is so narrow that. He doesn't understand that even for all the energy, it's actually such a narrow gap. In 10 or 6. In 10 or 6, if you put all the energy in the cosmic rays, and that again is for Paris conversion ratio 7, I think it's at the parts of the shell is still too narrow. Oh, you mean the offset shell is still too narrow in terms of the particle? Well, there might be other things. I play like a place. The diamond team is it? Oh, I don't know, maybe. Yes. They, they show, like, for instance, the grumpiness of the ambient medium can, uh, can also uh, affect this. And 
Il me semble qu'il y a des outils qui ont morts en effet dans le particule acceleration. Et je suis en même temps avec un outil qui peut être fait de ça. Donc, je suis considéré un simple requin, un clean requin, un type 1A, qui explose dans un uniforme médium. Mais en fait, il peut avoir un wind si c'est un star massif. Il peut avoir une homogénéité dans un médium médium. Il peut avoir une interaction avec le choc de la molécule clone, qui aide à détecter la radiation. Et donc, je suis focusé sur le choc de la molécule clone et dans l'interface avec le cosmic ray, mais je vais mettre ça dans le contexte pour un objet humain. Depending on what was the portion of the one and where I think it's expanding. Well, the neutrons can be important. Hmm? The neutrons can be very important. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Particular acceleration works with you know, ionized medium, and then when you encounter a molecular cloud, it might not be the case. And this might be different. I just remind the speaker that we have, we'll have half an hour of talk talks and discussions, so take the time. Don't rush to in 15 minutes. So the next speaker we will have is uh, Alice Stackenberg from the uh, University of Victoria. She's currently a CIFA National Fellow and a CIFA Global Scholar. Before that, she did her undergraduate and graduate at uh, the Captain Institute of University of Toronto in the Netherlands. And uh, she's been interested in the uh, chemical evolution of graph galaxies in the local group, the high and medium resolution spectroscopy, formation and evolution of the Milky Way, Halo, and the first stars. And today she will be concerned about her research. Thank you very much. I don't very often get introduced to such a nice uh,
constructed in this process, so there are some satellites that still remain. Uh, and of course, we do see satellite galaxies around the Milky Way today as well. Uh, so I'm interested in those, in those remaining dwarf satellites that we see both in simulations and in observations. And I'm trying to compare uh, our predictions of what we think those dwarf galaxies should look like with what they really look like in the real world. And I'm looking at different properties, like stellar masses and um, uh, their metallicities, but also more in detail to all the chemical elements that they have, that the stars have in their atmospheres. So just to show you briefly how this goes, so this is an overview, schematic overview of how this semi-analytic approach works. So from the dark matter simulation, you know uh, for each of the halo, in the, for each of the halos in the simulation, so both the big halo and all the subhalos within, you know their masses, you know how they are moving at which speed, so you know the velocities, the masses, uh, the merger histories. And on top of that, we are putting some variants in this halo. So what we start with in the early universe is some hot gas. So all of these halos have a hot gas fraction comparable to the variant fraction of the moon. But then some things are starting happening. So if the halo becomes massive enough, hot gas might cool and become cold gas. If cold gas becomes dense enough, which is just a simple density criterion, then you will start to form stars. So stars, of course, they live forever. They explode. They give energy and, and metals and, and all of that. They get that back to the medium in this recycling. Um, they might also kick. Uh, some gas actually outside of the galaxy into some projected components uh, because of the energy with which the supernova explodes. So this is, as you can see, a very simple scheme. So it is all analytic, so there's no gas particles, there's no star particles in simulation. So what you do is you just have these four different boxes in which variables can be in four different states. And you just move them around according to what's happening to your dark matter halo. Um, so, as I said, it's very crude. It is not at all the detail that some other people here in this room work on. Um, however, it does give you the opportunity to work with a very high resolution, a big simulation like the one I was showing. So, it's pretty fast, um, so that makes you, enables you to play with all of these recipes here and rerun the simulation several times over to understand what is going on. It's also a model that's been tested on larger scales, on the millennium simulation, for instance, on cluster scales and on bigger galaxy scales. So we, we inherited some of those prescriptions. And the idea is that you don't want to change everything again once you move to a smaller scale. So you want to keep some of the prescriptions the same and test them on the smaller scale structures. Uh, one more thing is that, of course, not every galaxy sits in the middle of its own dark matter halo. It, it can also, that dark matter halo can then become a satellite of another dark matter halo, which is happening with these dwarf satellite galaxies that I'm interested in. So in that case, there's another, uh, uh, there's, there's some other processes going on, where uh, stripping is one of them, so the stars can be stripped, the gas can be stripped, but also uh, we assume that if, in, if that happens, in that case we strip all of the hot gas away from this small satellite galaxy. And this is supposed to mimic something like red pressure stripping. So we think that this, uh, the main galaxy still has a very big hot halo around it, and we're just removing the hot halo from the satellite galaxy uh, in the stripping process. So what you get if you implement a very simple description like this is actually quite a good match of what we think uh, the Milky Way is. So as I said, the various simulations are six different. Uh, uh, simulations all Milky Way-like, however, none of them, of course, you expect to be exactly Milky Way. Um, so they're called A to F, uh, just to remember them. And they're shown in this uh, colored lines here, which is what's shown here is the number of satellites they have uh, uh, at a certain luminosity. So this is just counting, we're just counting for galaxy satellites. And the, the dotted line you see here is what we expect the Milky Way to have if we account for all the uncertainties and incompletenesses um, of the current survey. So if we just extrapolate, for instance, the SQS print on the sky to the full sky, then this is what we get. So what you see is that there's in particular one simulation, FRHB, which has a luminosity function very comparable to that. Uh, which, what is, what's also interesting is that if I look at the, the main uh, galaxy performing, so the thing that 
is supposed to look like the Milky Way, also the gradient B forms the best uh, match in a lot of properties to the Milky Way. So I'm, I'm, I am quite happy with that. The, the galaxy that I formed that looks most like the Milky Way also has a satellite system which looks most like the Milky Way. I also find that we have a very crude um, way to follow some sort of metallicity in the code. And uh, if we look at that, so if we look at metallicity, in this, in this case it's, it's magnesium versus luminosity, then I find that there is a trend there uh, which we know very well to exist also in the Milky Way satellite shown here as red. So the gray things here are the models for all the different uh, um, simulations combined. The black ones is sh just showing this Aquarius B, which I find to be a good match. And then the red here are the satellites that we're doing this way. So we seem to have to, to get like the most simple comparisons that we can do. There's another um, issue I was telling you about this red pressure strip. And so once you, you become a satellite of a bigger galaxy, you're losing all your hot gas. So that basically means you're losing your reservoir. Uh, so you don't have much gas available then to cool and to form new stars. So what that basically does is it tells a satellite galaxy that it cannot make a lot of stars anymore. It can still make some stars from the cold gas it still has, but there's no new gas available. And this is, a, of course, again, this is very simple, very rude. Uh, approximation to what's happening in reality. However, it does seem to get uh, approximately the right answer. It does seem to form the stars in more or less uh, the right times. So what I'm showing here is the well-known density morphology relation, um, which basically <coughs> shows you, so this is the local group. Here's Andromeda, here's the Milky Way. And you see uh, the other colors are all of the dwarf galaxies which surround these two galaxies, these two bigger galaxies. And uh, what you see is that they are color coded by different morphologies. So if you have dwarf spiroidals, which are old, they usually have old populations of stars. They don't have any gas today. They're not star forming. Then there's some dwarf irregulars, which are actively star forming today. And there's some things that are a little bit in between. And if you look at the distribution of these things, you see that it's not random, right? So you see that the, the, the red things, so the, the old and dead dark galaxies, are clustered around these two big ones whereas a lot of the blue ones are out in the field, with a few exceptions. If we then look in the simulation, and we, we basically plot the same thing, you see the same kind of trends, you see that the old and dead galaxies start to cluster uh, quite close to the midway, predominantly, and you see that there's a lot of blue things which are out by themselves in the field, with also a few interesting exceptions. So just to show you that the, it does give you more or less what you were uh, looking for. Now, of course, you can play the game. Now, once you have a simulation that you think is working only in reality, uh, you can try and find some things which look more or less like the things you, are, you see around you today and go into more detail. Um, so what I try to do here is I'll explain to select three galaxies that I know and love, which are Carina, Spotter, and Fornex. And so these, these are the three dwarf galaxies that we see around the Milky Way today that we've known for 50 years or so, that have a lot of data I've collected. So what is interesting in these three is that they have very different star formation histories. So Carina has this very peculiar star formation history where there is a few <coughs> stars. So there's two stars formed very early on, then uh, there's a majority formed uh, in an intermediate age. Oh, sorry, there's a few very old stars, there's a, major uh, there's a majority formed at an uh, early age and a few, uh, a few at a younger peak. Spelter, on the other hand, is one of those red and dead galaxies. Almost all of the stars are formed very, very late. And then it has a slight tail to some of the younger populations, but not much. Fornax is yet another example where you have a lot of the stars formed at very old age, but then there's this, this really big peak at uh, intermediate age as well. So what I was trying to do in the simulation is to find things which look more or less like this. And of course, I haven't targeted to form exactly these galaxies, but I I was encouraged that I could find examples which looked um, more or less like some of these. So this is, I think, a very good example of a 4-next light galaxy with a very strong peak at the intermediate ages, but also a, a strong old population. This one is not in by old population, and this one has, it's not exactly Carina, but it has at least this very weird, like, peak peak behavior. Now before I go on, there's something I want to tell you about the observations of these galaxies. So one thing that is very interesting, and 
and that we've learned only quite recently, um, I think the first uh, major paper to summarize this was in 2004, is that the dwarf galaxies can chemically be very different from the building blocks of the Milky Way halo. So if you look at individual stars in both the Milky Way and you look at individual stars in dwarf galaxies, and you just measure the elements in their atmospheres, you'll find out they're very different populations from each other. So what is plotted here is magnesium over iron again versus iron over hydrogen. And uh, here in gray, you see the stars, which all belong to different components of the Milky Way. And in the, well, the color points are all uh, stars that are in these dwarf galaxies. And what you can see is that at the similar at the over age, so suppose uh, minus 0.5 will be somewhere here, and etc. What you see is that there's no overlap almost in the magnesium over iron properties. And the most simple explanation for this is that they were different, they evolved at, at a different pace, chemically speaking. So if you start to form a galaxy and you start to form stars in them, what you first have is a lot of supernova type 2 exploding. And these supernova type 2, they have a certain ratio of, say, magnesium over iron that they form. Um, so as these things start to explode, you start to enrich the medium and then more and more enriched stars are forming. So basically what you do is you move into a horizontal line in this type of plots, right? So you're forming the same ratio of those two elements in these events. However, then after a certain time, you start to explode supernova 1A, and this takes a couple of, uh, this takes some time because they first have to form the binary and then most stars have to unfold and then so it takes a bit longer than these massive stars to explode. So what happens is that these events put a lot of iron in, but not so much magnesium. So what you start to do in this diagram is that you start to go down. The ratio is declining, right? So what this, what this kind of diagram shows you is that these, these supernova 1A events will kick in at approximately the same time in these different galaxies. However, because these galaxies were evolving at a different rate, they have reached a different metallicity before this starts happening, right? So if you look this way and you start to form lots and lots and lots of stars, you go quite fast in this horizontal direction before you start to explode a lot of 1As. Whereas if you're a dwarf galaxy, you might damage yourself very slowly, you lose all of the metals that you make because you're a low potential well and you're not moving that fast, so you're only going very slowly and then you start to make this uh, bridge here. So the idea is that the onset of 1As is at the same time with the different metallicities, and that gives you this difference. This is a very useful thing for observers as well, because it tells you something about, if you just see a star somewhere, it tells you something about what environment it was built in. So the movie I started with, where you saw the Milky Way being built up on smaller and smaller systems, you would be able, with this kind of mechanism, to create that back, right? Because you could look at stars which are in the Milky Way today, and you could figure out, just from their chemical evolution abundance, whether they were formed in a big or in a small system originally. So that is very helpful. And we do have some evidence that, that these different stars at the very earliest times, but I'll talk about that more in a different talk. It didn't, didn't let the Institute on Thursday, so if you want to hear about that, come and see that. Okay, we're starting to, um, going back to the modeling. So I had these three different dwarf galaxies um, that I was finding that looked a bit like what we have in the Milky Way. And um, I'm trying to uh, add now a very complex chemical evolution model to this. So I want to follow the different elements like I did in, in reality, like you have the observations. Um, so in this case, I had four different uh, models, which all looked a little bit like sculpture. So they were all old. They all formed the dominant population at old ages, and they don't form much at younger ages. Um, so their uh, evolution is still a little bit different, but they're all in a similar class. So when I try to uh, look at what these four different models are um, in this in this space of say, for instance, magnesium over iron versus iron that we saw, then I see that even these small differences in the different uh, star formation history do make a difference in where they end up on this diagram. So you can see it's a bit chaotic, and it's not at all what's 
so this, this gray line is showing what a very simple chemical evolution model will give you if the classical one where you know the inform law of gas is very nicely exponential and you know things that people have used before as a model of smart galaxies. Then the, the colored lines here show what the cosmological model gives you in which gas enclosed plots exponential at all, it comes in with mergers, it comes in very stochastically. There might be bursts of star formation which put out a lot of gas, there might be new inflow of gas with different metallicity. So you see that there's a lot, a lot more stochastic effects going on here, which makes the line much less nicely linear, but more uh, curled and twisted. <coughs> so one thing that you can immediately see is that there's sometimes a, a bit of a looping back and forth. Um, so what that means, of course, is that time and metallicity is not a one-to-one -one relation. So people like to interpret this as a time axis usually, but that of course depends on the history of the galaxy. If you have a lot of pristine gas coming in, uh, which dilutes your metallicity, then you are moving in that direction again, whereas then uh, stellar evolution and explosion of, of, of supernova, which enrich the material, will then move it in that direction. So what you see is that there's a lot of this zigzagging going on. Another thing which is interesting, and I think it's also something about the modeling that we are doing, is that it was also very, very difficult to reproduce this extreme as a portal, so to get stars below minus two to minus three, to get enough of them. So what we found in that every single model that we ran is that this went too fast. So that chemical evolution went too fast in the first stages, and that we were very quickly uh, ended up placing around minus 2.3 or so. Uh, and that there, then the rest of the evolution happened there. Whereas in reality, we do see this, this tail here, uh, which we have to uh, somehow uh, solve for in the models. So what I'm thinking is that, so we don't, for instance, have a good model for first stars in, which is one thing that the model is completely neglecting. Uh, the other thing is that you might have a stronger feedback then because you have a more massive IMF in the early stages, uh, which might help you with this problem as well. But this is something that uh, we should definitely investigate more because we didn't find any solution um, with the simple modeling at all. A different thing which you can use these models for is to have some insights in the mechanisms for winds and supernova. So as I said, there's uh, a lot of data for these galaxies. So we have a lot of abundances, not just magnesium, but also calcium, manganese, there's a few other elements as well. And you can try to use all of these to constrain your model. So one thing you can look at is uh, how much of these new metals can I put out in the supernova winds, and you know this is something which is not very well understood, uh, and how much do I need to leap in. So there's one, one way to constrain it is to look at the MDF, the metallicity distribution function, and just to see, okay, I need to make so much, so many stars of this metallicity, and I need to make so many stars of this metallicity. And there's, of course, ways to do that. So if I now say, okay, I, I just told you that my metallicity distribution function was too more, much peaked at the higher end. So if I just you know, put out a lot more metals, then I will peak it um, at a lower metallicity, which seems like a simple solution. However, if I just lose a lot of metals from the supernova right away, what I'm getting is that all the abundances are wrong as well. So, um, this doesn't work at all. So look at the dark blue lines here, where we have just said, okay, all metals leave the galaxy to never return. That doesn't seem to work in any of the abundance cases, and you get a very wrong answer here. So the, the point is that in order to reproduce the trends, we need to mix in newly formed metals with the medium before they are expelled from the galaxy. However, in order to reproduce the metallicity distribution function, we need to lose a lot of metals in order to not become too metal rich. So there's, a, there's an interplay in between these two things. And I guess the main point I want to emphasize is that we start to have enough data now and enough understanding to constrain uh, these two things together. Okay, for the last two minutes or so, I will talk a little bit about another implication of this. So this is very well known. I mean, dwarf galaxies are in shallow potential wells. They're small galaxies. They lose a lot of their baryons. Whereas if you explode the supernova in a dwarf galaxy, it has a different effect than if you explode it in a big galaxy. Um, and if we look just simply at the amount of baryons that dwarf galaxies have, we know that it is relatively lower compared to what we see in bigger galaxies. 
Another implication of this, what I'm saying, is that um, dwarf galaxies are much more troubled by interaction with their own dark matter satellites. So um, the two simple facts that lead to this is that first, dwarf galaxies have a lower baryon content, which all the observations seem to uh, uh, confirm. And, but then on the other hand, dark matter is approximately scale free. So you still have a dark matter halo with some satellite structure in it, like you have for a bigger galaxy. So the implication is that um, interactions with satellites have a larger impact than dwarfs. And in the case of dwarf galaxies, these satellites will be dark because they're too small themselves to make stars. So depending on the gas content of the dwarf, this could either lead to morphological changes, where a disk galaxy becomes more or less spheroidal, or it could use, lead to merger-induced uh, star formation. Just to show you this in a cartoon version, um, so this is not based on reality at all, it's just to show what's going on. So suppose we have a dark matter halo of a Milky Way like galaxy, and it has its own substructure of dark matter, and it has a stellar disk. It will have interactions with these dark matter clouds, but none of them are really bigger than the stellar disk, so the interactions don't really matter for the galaxy itself, for the visible galaxy itself. Now if we look at a dwarf galaxy, it's it's basically the same thing, but at a different scale. So you have to see that this is 100 times larger than this, but it's basically the same thing in dark matter, because dark matter is approximately scale free. However, this galaxy has lost a lot of its variants, because variants do care about scale. And very, I mean, the supernova has always the same energy, regardless on whether it, it goes off in this galaxy or it goes off in this galaxy. So it has lost a lot of its variants, therefore its disk is smaller, relatively speaking. So if this one, this guy had an interaction with one of its own satellites, it compares much more. And this disk could actually be uh, disrupted, or if it has a lot of gas still and it's very uh, stable against these perturbations, it might form a lot of stars in, in such an event. This is my last slide, just showing a movie of uh, this process happening. And um, this is a quite an extreme case in which a galaxy with only stars, so has no gas anymore, is having an interaction with one of its own satellites. And you don't see the satellite, because the satellite is dark, uh, but you will see what's happening, and there you see it. So this, this galaxy is quite disturbed by something unseen, and uh, will end up much more spherical. Okay, conclusions. Uh, the chemical evolution path for galaxies is very different from Milky components, and it is an opportunity for us to reconstruct the history of the Milky Way. There's a wealth of observational lenses which we can use to constrain uh, modeling, and um, the last point I showed you, merging with dark satellites has a larger impact on the world than has on the Milky Way galaxies. Thank you very much. Uh, so, towards the beginning, you showed a, a plot where basically you're saying that uh, by looking at the cell populations of these dwarfs, <coughs> you can infer something about their star formation history. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you are able to also measure the kinematics of the stars, would you be able to say something about the morphological history of these galaxies? Maybe when they had the yes. last major interaction or major merger, or when they fell into yeah. the different things? Yeah, you can definitely do that. So, if you do, and if you have a magnitude diagram of, of a galaxy, you can tell. Um, the ages of the different stars, right? Which is the technique you can use, and you can then um, see where those stars are, stars are in the galaxy, and, and get some radio velocity components. Um, so it is there is a lot of observational um, errors, which make this a little bit more difficult. So that um, ages, for instance, are not generally known beyond like 50 years. So, so a typical age error would be maybe here at the oldest ages. <laughs> However, uh, for a, a galaxy like Corina, which has these three different peaks, you can really try to then distinguish the oldest and the intermediate and the youngest component. So what we see in a lot of galaxies is that there is definitely an age gradient or even multiple populations. So what you see is that the oldest populations is, are the biggest ones spatially, and they're also uh, the hottest components kinematically, whereas the younger populations are more confined to the center and colder. Um, so yeah, it, it, that does, I think, tell you something about how that galaxy built up. So yeah, it's a lot of cool thing. Cool. Thank you. Sorry. What is causing the punching of the star? 
So it's mostly this, this process in which um, as soon as the galaxy becomes a satellite, it is um, losing its hot gas reservoir, so it cannot cool anymore. So that is one uh, way to quench this. Um, so it basically, that basically gives you the density morphology relation that I showed. However, uh, a lot of these galaxies are very small. So there's a lot of galaxies which are uh, quenching themselves um, because they, um, their own feedback ensures them to, be below, to have a density below the density pressure, the threshold for star formation. The reionization is implied in here as well. It, it, plays, a, it plays an important role, especially uh, no, definitely. That is one of the things you need uh, in order to make that luminosity function uh, correct. So, uh, sorry. so at the beginning you were talking about uh, picking halos that look like Milky Way like halos. Yeah. So what happens if you try and pick pairs of halos that look like Milky Way and Andromeda? Does that change anything? Is that beautiful? Uh, that's a good question and it's, it's, it's things we are looking into right now as a community. Mm -hmm. um, so <coughs> it's not easy to find pairs which look like the local group in every right. respect. Um, but, and it's quite tricky to, to run these simulations, but there are more and more of these suites uh, which are now run. Um, and of course, then you want to look at you know what's the difference, what's the influence of an Andromeda-like galaxy on the the, uh, the history of the way. And um, the answer is in a lot of properties, I think we don't see much difference. But then uh, this is works so there might be uh, there might be some interesting effects that we start seeing. This is things that. It's just starting happening. So our last speaker of the morning will be uh, Graham Addison from the University of British Columbia. So he just recently graduated from the University of Oxford. And is doing research in uh, cosmological foreground modeling and spending the established history from Herschel and Planck uh, observatories. And we're also doing uh, cross correlation between different uh, as well. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So I'm going to be talking about um, one of the things I've worked on both when I was a PhD student and in the last few months since starting at UBC. <coughs> Uh, I think I'll try and give a bit of an introduction um, to the CMB. Oh, that's not, not very well. Uh, okay, give me a second. My text seems to be uh, showing up strangely. Maybe we tried it before. Maybe. Sorry about this. I guess the moral of the story is don't put, don't put text over the bottom. 
I'm sorry? Outside of the box. Oh. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, so, um, right, so this, the, the microwave background is, is uh, a fantastically precise probe of cosmology. So one statement of that, which I think is, um, you know, just, just sort of encapsulates that, is that from this radiation emitted all that time ago, within the context of a flat standard lambda CDM model, which there is, in my view, relatively little evidence for current deviations, you can predict most low redshift cosmological probes, so local measurements of H0, for instance, you can predict those more precisely with this radiation from all this time ago than you can actually measure them. So you're talking about, you know, percent level precision on these measurements. Uh, of course, that, you know, that's great, but the low redshift measurements are still extremely important because we, you know, we want to go beyond the standard model, understanding what dark energy is and if it's evolved. Uh, you, you know, these are questions that we really need to answer. So the CMB doesn't tell us everything. Um, uh, even within the CMB, we're actually we're still not at the point where we really know everything we can learn. So several big things coming up which I really can't help but talk about. So in a couple of weeks, the, Planck, the first Planck cosmological results are out. And I'll talk a little bit more about uh, Planck later on. There's also a, a huge developing field of CMB polarization which existed for a while, um, but it's really taking off with, with more Planck data and small-scale polarization experiments. For this talk, I'm just going to concentrate on the temperature measurements. Um, but you know, I think it's good to be aware that there's a lot more, you know, some more developments in the next couple of years uh, on, on those ones. Okay, well, uh, never mind, there's nothing too important in that equation. So, how do we go from measurements of uh, the microwave sky to an actual constraint loss problem in cosmology? Well, the statistical choice is the power spectrum. So, what we do is decompose the temperature fluctuations in some given direction, theta phi on the sky, into um, basically uh, spherical harmonics. So, this YLM is a standard sort of spherical uh, basis of uh, functions. And then to construct the power spectrum, which is a two-point correlation function that tells you about the size of uh, correlations in your um, fluctuations in the, the sky temperature as a function of angular scale, we then basically add up these ALM coefficients. And we get a plot that looks something like this, which I think, you know, everyone I, I guess will have seen the part from sort of here this way. Um, I, uh, or rather, Mark Hartland has extended this plot to include more recent data. So I think you know this is such a such an important part of what I'm going to talk about. I think I should just go through it in more detail. So here is the spherical harmonic multipole moment. So small scales are this way on this plot, and large scales are this way. This is this uh, angular power spectrum I mentioned, and these are three well the three current experiments that. Um, are giving us the most precise constraints on this. So WMAP we have here finished observing a while ago, the nine-year final cosmological results were out in December. WMAP had a uh, point spur function of about 13 odd minutes. So we'd observe down to multiple moment of around 900 or so. Um, what I'm going to talk more about in uh, the next 15-20 uh, minutes is what happens on the small scales. I'm not having great luck with this. Oh, I see what the problem is. The computer got the uh, So two, um, two experiments that really are providing constraints complementary to WMAP at the moment are the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, which I, I'm a, a part of that team, along with uh, folks here, so Dick Bond, Mike Nolter, uh, Mia. And so ACT is a six meter uh, telescope situated at high elevation up in Chile. And its goal was really to, to start where WMAP kind of stopped and push down to angular resolutions of a few arguments. The South Pole Telescope, as you can see, or as you can guess, is situated at the South Pole. It has very similar goals to ACT. Uh, and so between the two experiments, you can see that we really extend 
<coughs> this measurement of these acoustic peaks in the power spectrum down to, you know, maybe eight or nine peaks, or well, nine if you split at this point. Kind of and these, these points do all have error bars on them. Um, I think one thing, one thing that I find that's amazing is that Planck will give us a fantastic improvement in signal to noise out to about here on this plot. Right. So this is the range. This is the range of angular scales which Planck will really nail. And we're obviously, we don't have any signal to noise there already, right? It's, <laughs> it's not obvious looking at this that um, you know, we really need that extra precision, but it does happen that that will you know, that will still give us a big improvement in the times. Okay. So, oh, I apologize again for the problem that's slightly distorted. Um, I want to talk about some of the issues you have with these small scale anisotropy measurements that weren't a problem so much for WMAP. And basically the issue is, you know, you want to pick out the CMB, but that's not the only thing in, in the sky. Even at the peak of the black body spectrum, so around 150, 160 gigahertz, other astrophysical components are present. And so one thing we need to be able to do if we're going to make these high precision measurements is separate those other components from the part that we're interested in. So this plot shows the three-year act power spectrum. This is this gray line here is the same uh, solid line that was plotted on the previous slide. And you can see the data points, which haven't come up very clearly, the data points clearly lie way above this great prediction, down, once you're down to scales of a few odd minutes and then small scales going this way. So why is that? Well, that's exactly because there are all these other components. You can see sort of five or six colored lines which start to dominate the stamping tail. Um, we really want to get out what, that, what the CMB is doing. So there's information on these small scales that WMAP and well, to some extent, Planck, you know, could still gain from, from having access to our data down at these scales. So just a couple of examples. Having a wide sort of, um, a wide range of angular scales, both a, a wide range of physical scales on the last gathering surface. <coughs> so one thing this tells us about is the shape of the primordial uh, fluctuation spectrum. So this ties into uh, inflationary models, and certainly SPT, ACT, and WMAP and now um, we're getting to the point of constraining or, or showing tension with very simple inflationary models just based on the shape of the primordial power spectrum and sort of how many, um, how many e-foldings are required in inflation versus the form of the, the input on potential. So this is, you know, this is something that's getting interesting. Also, the number of effective uh, relativistic species, so if there's an extra neutrino, that would actually have an effect in the standard tail, whereas it really doesn't have too much effect in the more WMAP probes. And a couple of other things, uh, abundance of primordial helium and um, gravitational lensing, which the is going to be a bit more about. So the statement of the problem that we have to solve, which I'll spend most of the rest of my talk going through, is that ACT has, or for this analysis, ACT has two frequency channels. There's clearly more than two components in these colored lines. So we had to do something to try and understand some of these things. We couldn't do a component separation based on different frequency dependence. Okay, so as to physically what these uh, other components are, first of all, we have the sunier soldovich effect. So this is the upscattering of CMB photons by relativistic or uh, energetic electrons. This is a cosmological interest. I mean, the fact that I'm saying these things are sort of uh, getting in the way of the primary signal doesn't mean they're not interesting in their own right. Um, so the, the sunier zoldovich effect, we can kind of decompose into two parts. There's a thermal part which comes from scattering off electrons in very hot plasmas in the center of, of massive galaxy clusters. And there's a kinetic component, which is a Doppler shift, which comes from where you have electrons uh, with a bulk motion in the presence of a uh, density or ionization gradient. And um, I'll talk a bit more about, about that later. Uh, basically, for the purpose of describing what this contribution looks like in the power spectrum, we have simulations which give us a pretty good handle on this. Uh, the amplitude in simulations sort of 10 years ago was actually way higher than we're now finding. Um, but the shape of the power spectrum and its frequency dependence are pretty well known. So, so you know, we're pretty much okay on this front to understand what this is doing. Another issue is unresolved uh, galaxies, which look like point sources in the CMB scale. 
So broadly speaking, two populations, uh, synchrotron-dominated radio galaxies and then dust-dominated galaxies. And it's the second population I'm going to be focusing on. So ideally, you know, we'd mask all of these out from our maps before calculating the power spectrum. And that works great for the ones that are very bright and that we can resolve. But we're nowhere near sensitivity-wise probing down to the faintest, certainly faintest, first galaxies. So there's a residual unresolved component that we have to try and model. And then finally, there's mission from our own galaxy. Um, there's no frequency really where you can observe the CMB without having to worry about at least some galactic emission. Acting SBT probing small scales, they choose areas of sky which are pretty free from galactic emission. So this isn't such a big deal for us. It's a very big deal for Planck, but of course Planck have a, a, a lot of frequency channels purely to do this component separation, so purely to get rid of the galactic emission. Okay, so let's think for a second about. Uh, oh, no, no, okay. About the, how these uh, different um, extra galactic point sources, galaxy populations, contribute to that power spectrum. So these radio galaxies are actually not such a problem. They're, they're relatively rare. They have a, a fairly random sort of Poisson distribution on the sky, and this means you know what their contribution to the power spectrum is. Remember, the power spectrum tells you about fluctuations as a function of scale. And if you have a random Poisson distribution, then there is no scale information, right? So this means we know what the shape of that component is. And that's great. Yeah, that's exactly what we want. So no such luck for these dust galaxies. So these things are understood to be actively star-forming or star-burst galaxies. Some high redshift, high red some kind of more nearby. Uh, I guess the, the basic picture to have here is that you have, you, know, you have a population of microscopic dust grains, which are silicates or graphites. They absorb UV light from young stars in their galaxy, and then re-emit somewhat stochastically um, at uh, much longer wavelengths. And so it's that emission which gets redshifted into the microwave, which we then observe. And the problem with these galaxies is that they're highly spatially clustered. So we kind of, we learned this only really sort of last five or six years with observations from Spitzer and then BLASTS, which was a precursor to Herschel Space Telescope. But this clustering is a problem, because this, this spatial clustering obviously tells us, you know, um, sorry, this spatial clustering corresponds to a more complicated shape in the power spectrum. These aren't randomly distributed. It's not a purely Poissonian sort of, sort of pattern. So this is what I spent most of my PhD thinking about. Um, and, and the solution came from looking at higher frequencies. Um, so before I talk through this plot, one of the problems with the, the CMB frequencies, well, it is, as, you know, as I've been saying, all these different components do contribute. That's not true if you go to higher frequencies, so lower wavelengths. So if you go into the submillimeter and far infrared, you really only have these dusty galaxies as an extragalactic contribution. And that's great, you know, to be able to isolate that component and see what it's doing would be ideal. And so what we did, and this is an analysis that was led by uh, Amir, is we cross-correlated maps from ACT, so our CMB maps, that contain these foregrounds we're trying to understand, with blast maps in the submillimeter, which are really dominated by these dusty galaxies. And if you just focus on a couple of panels over here, basically um, this is an angular power spectrum plot, so like the CMB plots that I showed you before. So <coughs> small scales are this way, and large scales are that way. It's plotted such that the Poissonian sort of uh, random distribution of point sources will generate a flat power spectrum, and then any structure, so any shape, so these other lines rising, that's the clustering signal. So what happens if you cross-correlate a pair of maps? Well, the signal you get is coming from the things common to both maps. So if those dust galaxies that dominate in the far and further millimeter were the same guys, that we need to worry about in the millimeter, we'd see a signal here. And that's exactly what we were looking for, and that's exactly what we found. So I think it's, it's clearest in this panel. So this is what happens if you cross-correlate the 1.4 uh, micron, so this is 220 gigahertz act map, with the 500 micron blast map. So some of these other combinations are, are pretty noisy, but there's a pretty clear uh, protection here of some sort of scale that's going on. Can you tell me what L that is? Oh, sure, yeah. 
So multiply this by about 20,000. Um, so there's, there's different conventions, unfortunately, in how to report these units. So, th so this is around, this is uh, about 10. Yeah, that's right. That's right, this is around 1,000, and the spacing between these points is around 900. So this goes out to around 9,000. So these are scales of a couple of arc minutes, and then kind of 10-ish arc minutes. So equipped with this knowledge that the dust of galaxies that we care about as a nuisance are, to a large extent, those same galaxies that really dominate these high frequencies. You know, my idea was, well, let's get a handle on this clustering by doing a joint fit across a range of frequencies. So I took early uh, data from Planck. So Planck, with its many frequencies, was able to really isolate this dust of galaxy component very nicely. And data from BLAST and also the BLAST correlation analysis. And this is what I found. So these are uh, power spectrum plots showing different wavelengths. The red line is the uh, fit. This is a cluster component only, so this is the part that has a shape. And you can see that, um, you know, this this very simple, so this is a you know, log log scales, this is obviously just a simple power law. This does pretty well across this range of frequencies. Uh, so, you know, this I think was a very useful result because, you know, if this is true, then we really have to include only a pretty simple component when we come to do our CMD fitting to try and model what this contribution looks like. So that's great and slightly surprising. Um, it's a bit weird that, you know, there's a big range in wavelength here. So although we know there's overlap in these sources, because of the, the way the cake uh, correction depends on frequency, you wouldn't necessarily expect the bright sources at this end to also be the bright sources at this end. So you're probing a range of redshifts here. And it certainly is an obvious in advance that you'll get the same shape clustering behavior sort of integrated over all those sources at 200 gigahertz as we do at 1200 uh, gigahertz of microns. So essentially what I'm saying is that at this end, most of the sources, the bright sources are very low redshift. So it's sort of, well, sorry to say low redshift, I mean less than one. Um, whereas uh, anything less than that 100 is low redshift for me. Uh, but up here, these, these sources, based on the shape of the spectral energy distributions, you'd expect to be high redshift. So as I say, it's a bit of a mystery that there's a simple power law uh, relation that doesn't seem to scale much with frequency. Um, and this is kind of, the same thing happens actually in optical galaxies. So this is a power, uh, well, it's not a power spectrum, it's a two-point correlation function. So it's telling you the same sort of clustering information. It's from um, the main sample of STSS galaxies. So now scale is increasing this way and decreasing that way. But the point is that although deviations from a simple power law are clear, you know, for these different luminosity uh, samples, the shape still looks kind of power law-ish. So this is a, a, a funny thing. It's, it's a, I'm pretty sure it's, it's a coincidence, and that's certainly you know what people what people think. There's a combination of linear, non-linear, and sort of quasi-linear clustering scales all contributing here. So how that you know why that should necessarily come out as a power law? There's no clear sort of physical explanation, but I'll take it. I mean I'm happy with this because <laughs> this is very nice to try and model, uh, and it turns out. Oh, I should just say so. So some recent work I've done. Uh, back on the dust of galaxies is showing with, when you combine Herschel and Planck data, the early Planck data, you do see some deviations from this, from this power law. So consistent we've seen some deviations in the optical data. Um, but they're not big enough to worry about from a CMD point of view, or from an ACT point of view, I should say. So when, when all that's sort of said and done, what do we do for ACT? Well, we combine the ACT channels. We use the simple template, this power law template, with a, um, sort of a, a freedom in frequency scaling between our two channels and we marginalize over. We ended up with a very good agreement, uh, DG here means dust galaxy, by the way, for example, with the uh, We found good agreement with the joint that I've done to Planck and Blast data. And we also found that for the parameters we're interested in, so you know, cosmological parameters, the shifts were very small if we actually marginalized over much wider ranges of, of shapes for this clustered cluster galaxy contribution. So this is all this is all great. Um, so from an ACT and SPT's point of view, you know, this is an understood solved problem. Well I say solved, I guess it was never much of a problem in the first place, but uh, clearly it would be interesting to see 
you know, plan to take on this and, and how much more of an impact it's uh, as a plan. So in the remaining five minutes, uh, let me quickly talk about a more recent problem that's not yet solved. So remember I said the power spectrum is a two-point correlation, and I talked about these different foreground components as if they were independent. But in fact, it's a spatial correlation between, for instance, the clusters that give us the semi Zoldovich effect and these dust galaxies. There's going to be some extra contributions to the power spectrum over the sum of those two individual terms. So this is what I've been spending time worrying about recently. Um, the, good, the good news is that allowing for these correlations, so either a sort of radio dust galaxy correlation or you know, cluster dust galaxy correlation, it doesn't make any difference for cosmological parameters. You know, that, which, is, which is great. But if you're interested in the Sinead-Zoldovich effect, this is a problem. And I'm going to talk about why that is. Okay, so the correlation I, I'm, that's most a, mostly a problem is this correlation between clusters and dusty galaxies. So I guess, um, naively, you wouldn't think this is a big problem because most of the clusters we see in the low redshift, again, low redshift being, well, low redshift actually being, I guess, less than 0.5 in this context. We think of these clusters as having you know, large numbers of galaxies, many of which are, are not forming stars actively. They've run out of gas through you know, whatever process. There's maybe some star bursting going on as objects fall into clusters. We wouldn't expect a significant correlation <coughs> between dust emission and the senior Zoldovich effect from the massive clusters. But the, the problem region is sort of lower mass guys, so I guess this is, I think this more because as a group than a cluster, at higher redshift. So these things contribute to the Sunyev Zondovich power spectrum, but typically we don't have a good handle on them from optical or X-ray studies. And this is just a picture which I will try and flip the colors on. Uh, so this is a cluster that we discovered with that via the Sunyev Zondovich effect. So these contours are showing um, the maximum Sunyev Zondovich effect in the middle. The X is the X-ray peak and then these blobs are members of the cluster or coincidental foreground sort of galaxies. So, so these are the clusters that we see with the Sunyev Zoldovich effect. But the problem is that like for those galaxies, most of the clusters and, and groups that contribute are unresolved. So guys like this, while we can study them, we can do this nice sort of optical follow-up, <coughs> they don't really tell us about this contribution that we need to try and understand. Uh, Okay, so, so it's this correlation between the thermal Sunyev Zoldovich effect and dust galaxies that I'm thinking about. The reason this is especially annoying is because its frequency dependence ends up looking like a black body over the range of frequencies that act in SPT probe. So in this plot, you see this orange line is the dust galaxies. Uh, flat on this scale is something that looks like a black body, so that's either the primary CMB or the kinematics in the Ozolovich effect, which is this Doppler shift, serves the black body, which just shifts the temperature. And the blue is the thermal SS. So the blue and the orange have very distinct signatures. But when you take a correlation between them, the power spectrum is this red line. And right around the reactor is pretty sensitive, you know, this doesn't look too different from flat. And this is a big problem, because getting it um, the kinematic SS is, is interesting, and it's, our constraints are degraded hugely if we allow for this, uh, this correlation I've been talking about. So basically, if you look at zero on these plots, so if you take a slice through zero here, this is the size of the kinematic, it's in the air, of constraint, in the units of power from, from SBT. And if you allow freedom in the correlation between thermal in the air, of the clusters and the dust galaxy, you, you know, these contours just explode. And you know, no one really thought this would be a, uh, an issue before a year or two ago. And then SPT uh, realized you know, this frequency dependence is really, uh, really a nuisance. Um, so my last couple of slides, just very quickly, are about future and ongoing work that I've been doing with um, other CETA folks, actually. So Mia and also Adam Hinks, to try and understand this correlation. So this plot shows, as a function of redshift, how much of the flux or intensity is coming from um, you know, which, which range for the thermal SZ effect, the dusty galaxies seen by Herschel, and dusty galaxies seen by ACT. 
And the point here is that there's more overlap in redshift between the clusters and the Herschel, the, the galaxies seen by Herschel, so this is again because of the difference in negative K direction, than there is between Hacks and the clusters. So if we're interested in this, this overlap region, then clearly it's bigger between red and blue. So one thing we're trying to do is to cross-correlate Hacks and Herschel maps and try and see from an increased signal to noise whether we can improve constraints on the thermal asset does galaxy correlation. And we're hoping, you know, with, with a joint fit to the Herschel data and ACT data, we're, we're aiming, well, I think this is sort of my prediction, we're aiming for sort of a 1.5 microkelvin squared pneumatic SF constraint, which is getting interesting for constraining um, the, the kinematic SF models, particularly relating to models of extended um, reionization, which involve you know, these uh, expanding spheres of ionized gas. They, they contribute at the level we're going to be sensitive to. So, you know, it's, it's pretty cool to have a probe of reionization from the CMB. And we're, we're getting close to that. Uh, one thing that um, Adam and Amir and I have been working on recently is what happens if you take a, a resolved cluster catalog? So, a list of catalogs where you know a list of clusters, you know exactly where they are and what redshift they are. If I make a map from that to do a cost correlation, what does that look like? So this is just uh, this is sort of a, a, a taste of it, if you like. This is all still low redshift, so not super relevant for the, the problem I've been talking about. But I think it's very promising. So what Adam and Amir did is they took the max BCGs, these are optical SGSS clusters, cross-correlated with an iris map, which is full of unresolved dust galaxies. And they find this huge cross-correlation. So the interpretation of this is quite interesting. I think you've got a component on sort of small scales from dust galaxies actually sitting inside clusters. And then on large scales, you've sort of just got the fact that they're both tracing the same large scale structure. But uh, you know, this is this is a detection of sort of 40 sigma significance, which is you know, compared to the previous detection of clustering in iris, which is around one sigma, is a pretty substantial improvement. So I think this is something that's going to be interesting. Uh, I'm running over a little, so I'll stop now. Uh, so, conclusions. The dusty, dusty galaxies were a bit of a headache for modeling the CMB temperature on isotopy on the small scales. For the primary cosmological parameters, it turns out you know, we're all good. From an SPT point of view, we can use simple templates and really show that we're not biasing our constraints. Still an open question, which I'm thinking about, I'm sure folks on SPT are thinking about, uh, relating to the correlation between clusters and dusty galaxies particularly for the kinematics and the resolved constraints. And you know, in a few weeks, all eyes will turn to blank, and then we'll see how they <coughs> deal with these foregrounds. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, just one question. So I, I see how you can do this template matching to extract things from the primary CMB with the dusty galaxies are not a big problem. Right. But from what I understand, Groups at intermediate redshift for something like half of the SC signal at over 3,000. So, is it really feasible just to do the same template subtraction? You're going to have to yeah. considerably more sophisticated. Is no, you're absolutely right. So, for the SZ effect, we, we go to simulations, right? So, we can understand even down to those lower masses. We go, we know, we have a handle on the effects of AGN feedback and so on on the electron populations and on the semi-solid effect. So, so certainly there isn't a simple template. That we you know pull out of somewhere for the for that component. You know we, we really have to go to the hydrodynamic simulations. And you know people here have been impactively involved in this. So um, so Dick and um, uh, John Cedars when he was here, and also Nick Tiger who was a student. I guess he was a huge fan too of the Cedar. Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry, I skipped uh, follow along with. Uh, Oh, you mean actually say something about the physics of the galaxies? Yeah, rather than just saying I want to get rid of this. Yeah, no, that's right. And this is something else I've kind of worked on but didn't talk about. So absolutely, that's true. It's a little bit of an awkward statistic to use, the power spectrum, because you have an integrated contribution from all the unresolved galaxies in your map. Right, so you don't know in advance the redshift distribution, the temperature distribution. So there's some degeneracies there which make things very difficult. Not like you have a nice catalog of these are these bright galaxies that we can go and study. But that said, when you combine the power spectrum measurements with, say, um, heat number counts, 
you know, do a sort of joint analysis, you can use the power spectrum to help improve constraints. So getting a frequency arm that goes down to the microwave, that's a, that's a nice constraint on the SED properties of some of these galaxies. So yeah, you can, you can do that bit, yeah. So, uh, for the fact that the foreground, the more component outside the dragon is higher, the increment is higher than the dragon back. Can you speak up a little bit? I mean, for the foreground. Yes. Uh, in uh, some foreground that outside the dragon is That's right. That's in a higher magnitude. That's right. If so, uh, what do you think is more sensitive? Right, so that's exactly where Actin SMT chose to look, you know, away from the main galactic contribution. Um, so 150, 160 gigahertz is a pretty good bet. I mean, that's as good as you can get because the CMB is, is you know, you're close to the peak of the CMB, and there happens to be a nice curve <coughs> between sort of dust and synchrotron, which is which is convenient, right? We could have lived in a galaxy where we have no hope of doing these things. Um, yeah. So so the dusty galaxies, radio galaxies, the S the Sinyatsolovich effect, those are the components around 150 gigahertz. If you go too far to either direction then um, you know you really have to worry about what the guards are doing. One last question. Uh, yeah, in the in the power spectrum clip that you showed, I mean yeah. between ASP or ACT and, and, and the South Pole telescope, yeah. um, the error bars show that you show are impressive to me because you can see them, but does it tell you something about the systematics of that kind of search? Yeah, so so this is a, a kind of a whole different kind of words, which is interesting to be too much, probably should be too much. But um, so at this end, there's a slightly different foreground correction, which means that these points aren't directly comparable. So I should remake this plot when we've done a foreground correction. So right. well spotted. Uh, yeah, there is mild tension between the action SBT results. So um, my my money is on a small systematic and a, slot, and a, you know, a combination of a, a, a small systematic pet and some unfortunate statistical scatter. I don't think it's anything serious. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, SMT prefer a bit of a, uh, a more suppressed damping tail, which affects things like neutrino constraints. If Planck wasn't three weeks away, I'd worry more about it, but that's exactly where Planck's going to nail. So we'll find out soon. Okay. Thank you,